Hi, I'm Kendra Winchester and welcome back to my channel. So today we're going to be talking about my favorite author of all time. Yes, that is Virginia Woolf, the Virginia Woolf, and she is fantastic. So I wasn't sure how much I was going to go into detail in this video because it could get really long really fast. We are going to start um, with some of her books and we're just going to go through in loosely chronological order and talk about them because I love them. All right, so let's start with Jacob's Room, which I feel is a great time to talk about her family. So Virginia Woolf uh, was born Virginia Stephen and her parents had both been married previously and so um, they brought children to the marriage. Her older half brother, uh, most likely from the evidence that we have, uh, probably sexually abused her when she was younger. So when her parents died, uh, Virginia Woolf got married to her late 20s, early 30s, so she had to live with a guy, right? So she lived with her brother, her full brother, um, and then her brother went to war and was over, I believe, in the Mediterranean area and got a fever and died. So this is kind of her ode to her brother that died. Um, and this is her like second, third novel somewhere. I always get this one in night and day swapped. I don't really remember which one came first. Um, but this is about Jacob and his room. And this is a, the first entrance of her stream of consciousness style. Her first book, Voyage Out, was more traditional. And then you have this book, Glorious experimental -ness. But this is about a dude and really about, I think, her brother and her feelings around her brother's death. And we really see her... Um, how she really is a pacifist and she really hates war and she also is very aware of the mental effects of war. Virginia Woolf herself has uh, what we probably would call now bipolar disorder. She had really big ups and downs and was institutionalized several times in her life, especially after she was publishing a book um, and it came out and the critics uh, would, you know, have their reviews and stuff. She really had a hard time. So anyway, uh, this is really an ode to her brother. And this is, she hasn't really hit her stride yet. Her first three novels are more like uh, getting into her groove and experimenting. And this is her first, as I said, experimental novel. It's also public domain, which is why it does not match any of the other novels, which bugs me. Yes, it does. Moving on to her really first great novel. This is about under 200 pages. And she published this with, she and her husband, Leonard uh, Wolf had a press and he ran the press and she wrote for it. Yes, they published this book and this is Mrs. Dalloway and this is my favorite novel, just pretty much period, because I relate to it so much and I can see so much of Virginia in the book on its own. If you take out Authority on 10, if you're one of those people, this book stands on its own, hands down. But if you look, are a Virginia Woolf lover, you could see so much of her in this book. It's not as good as uh, the To the Lighthouse or The Waves, but it's just, it's still beautiful. Like you can't, I mean, look at those tabs. And I have it underlined everywhere, which is why I also own this pristine hardback edition that actually matches, which is lovely. We have Clarissa Dalloway. She is having a dinner party. And so this novel is set in a single day and you, she actually names like streets in London and she just walks along and you have stream of consciousness. And she meets this guy, Peter, who she was kind of part of like this three friends set. Um, and there's kind of like a love triangle going on there actually because Peter loves Clarissa, but Clarissa loves Sally. And uh, so later at the dinner party, both Peter and Sally and Clarissa are together for the first time, I believe in a long time. And it really talks about what happened and why, you know, Clarissa did fall in love with her husband, Richard. Um, but now, you know, she has some mental illness problems, uh, depression, I think. And um, it's more, like he treats her like a child. It is not a marriage of equals. And yeah, so she really wonders what would have happened if she had been with Sally. But of course, society at the time never, never would have gone for that. So it really just delves into this beautiful story um, that there is. And you have so much going on with this book and she doesn't wave the pom-poms or anything it's just there it's just the most natural core stream of consciousness thing it's beautiful um there's a subplot where a guy has ptsd from coming back from the war and how he doesn't get the help he needs so you have the two types of uh society not helping people who have you know a different type of mentality or a chronic illness or whatever and it's just really amazing yeah 
So I could gush about this for a while, so I'm just going to put it down and we could talk about it in the comments if you want. But I want to point out The Hours by Michael Cunningham, which is sort of like a retelling of Mrs. Dalloway. And it has when Virginia Woolf was writing it. Uh, there's like a housewife in the 50s, 60s reading um, Mrs. Dalloway. And then you have a retelling of Mrs. Dalloway set in the present where Clarissa actually um, is with Sally. So uh, this was made into a movie with an all-star cast and including Nicole Kidman and Meryl Streep. Yes, yes, please. Next is To the Lighthouse. Again, lots of tabs. So this is about Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. Again, has all kinds of couple relations going on. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey are the matriarch and patriarch of uh, the family. And they have like, what, seven kids? Something like that? Lots of kids. And they're on this beach. Um, I think an island of sky or something? Rocky coast of Scotland. I don't know. So they're on vacation up on the rocky coast of Scotland there and there's the lighthouse you see and the whole thing is about going to the lighthouse and obviously there's a lot of Freudian phallic symbols stuff going on there but primarily this is about the relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey and how Mr. Ramsey is an emotional parasite. He's so focused with his own academic achievements. He believes that his wife is just there to make him happy and to give him emotional support and to remind him, not tell him, remind him how wonderful he is. There's also a wonderful stream of consciousness dinner scene in this thing. She's all about dinner scenes. You can see she did this short story uh, about uh, Mrs. Clarissa Dalloway um, at dinner scene. And yeah, so this book is just so much in it and uh, she really delves into the how, you know, you need emotional equality, not just like general equality. She delves into the different, I guess, layers of a marriage of equals. And uh, she really hasn't delved into her whole androgynous theme that she we're gonna talk about here in a second, but she really is kind of getting there. And uh, this novel's written in three sections, the Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, in their first vacation you have like this like little bridge section which is like Virginia was on acid she took a stream of consciousness to a whole nother level and then you have the last section which is 10 years later when Mr. Ramsey is having to face that Mrs. Ramsey is dead and so he tries to like latch on like parasitically to uh, another uh, single woman and he thinks that her place is to um, support him emotionally she's like no I'm not your wife I don't want to be your wife ah. anyway it's great. Just go read it. I'll, I'll quit gushing. Yeah. Speaking of emotional parasites, we have Lotto and Mathilde from Fates and Furies. And so I had the greatest fortune of being able to have, go to a bookstore and hear Lauren Groff talk. And she really loves Virginia Woolf. And she said that Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey from To the Lighthouse loosely inspired Lotto and Mathilde. And if, I don't want to give any spoilers for this book. I don't care about giving spoilers to Virginia Woolf's books, but if you know this book and you've read this book, you've probably just clicked. Like, oh yes, I totally see that because as you know, this is told from the husband's perspective first and then we flip and we go to the wife's perspective. Um, so it's kind of like two novels just in one and this novel is fantastic and I, I love it. So yes. So next we have Orlando, which is, um, Orlando is a guy born in around the Elizabethan era and he goes through life, he's immortal and sometime, I guess halfway between there and Victoria's reign. Uh, he just wakes up one day and he's a woman, still called Orlando. Um, and so this is about um, Virginia Woolf believing in androgyny. Virginia Woolf says in A Room of One's Own, it is fatal to be a man or a woman, pure and simple. One must be woman manly and man womanly which she's trying to say, I mean, if you think at the time period, men and women's gender roles were way, way more separated than they are now, obviously. Women could not wear pants and they could not really get an education. And so what she wanted to point out was that we need more equality and acknowledge that, you know, women have stereotypical masculine traits. They can be strong and brave and courageous and so on. And men can be sensitive and caring and loving and she really wanted to promote those ideas. And so she really takes her thesis of androgyny in that statement and turns it into this book. And it is just a really quirky, fun book. Um, I think you could see just a lot of random things going on in this book. Um, and it really talks about, um, I think this has her ideal marriage. Um, Orlando marries a guy that used to be a woman and so they both have qualities of each other and they both bring out the best in each other and they treat each other as equals um, on all the layers of 
things. So yeah, uh, this is a really interesting fun book and Virginia shows that she can actually be funny. Surprise, surprise. Last novel we're going to talk about, but certainly not least, is The Waves. Now The Waves is probably her literary masterpiece. Probably. I struggle with it because as I said, it's like she was on acid. You know what I'm saying? Like it's stream of consciousness to an extreme level and it is gorgeous and is beautiful and she is a genius but I personally struggled to connect with it like I did her other novels um but I probably just need to sit down and reread this because when I first read To the Lighthouse I hated it so I think this just needs a little more love from me so she really solidified her place in you know the literary canon and um yeah The Waves is beautiful I would not say start with this I would say start um, probably go chronologically through her novels because that makes more sense. Um, but as I said, and we're going to end with The Room of One's Own because I think it is perfect. You can see it is dying. I've had this copy for a while and I marked it up so much. So I ended up buying a hardback copy of it so that I would, <laughs> so I would make sure that it would last. But yeah, this is my beloved paperback that I have totally done horrible things to. It is a beautiful, beautiful book about women's education and how um, men oftentimes are more concerned with their own superiority than a woman's inferiority. So, so how they wouldn't let women into libraries and into different uh, academic s settings. Um, and then she also talks about Shakespeare's sister, which is uh, like the hypothetical kind of Shakespeare boom for a boy, but she just uses a sister and that how if she had been equally as talented, she never would have had the chance to cultivate her talent. And when I first read this in college, that really, um, it really changed the way I viewed the world. And so growing up, feminism was a dirty word, you know, it's associated with bra burners and rebellion and all of these horrible things when actually feminism is what gave us the right to vote. It's what, what, it's what made marital rape illegal. It's what made us married women legally allowed to work, um, in the United States across all 50 states. Uh, we can now open bank accounts without our husband's permission and we can, um, own property, inherit property. Uh, we have a right, legal right to our kids, which women first didn't. And so that is what feminism has done. And I think it is definitely disrespectful not to acknowledge that and what feminism has done for us. And um, I would probably pair this book and uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's uh, We Should All Be Feminists together. Like, you know, feminism thesis in less than 200 pages. Uh, because I think this is a good starting place for other people who feel that feminism is a dirty word or grew up that way or whatever, that this is very accessible and you see the basic uh, need for women to also be educated and to be given a chance um, at their own independence financially um, and in their careers. And um, I think all of Virginia's works really promotes egalitarianism in marriage and uh, a way where both men and women can have a partnership rather where a woman is legally a minor and just an object to be owned like we saw in Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. Like there was genuine love from Mr. Ramsey but he obviously thought she was there for him. And so ultimately I think this pretty much encapsulates Virginia Woolf's uh, beliefs and ideas in a single volume. You can also pair this with Three Guineas which expands more on her dislike of war and how if we had to meet more representation um, in government there would be fewer wars because it would be a more balanced perspective on the world because she believed that both men and women needed each other and that uh, you cannot have one you know a complete balance without the other and I just thought that was beautiful um, and it really debunks the idea that feminists hate men because she really uh, she talks about how, you know, we need either like two parts of a whole kind of idea. And I, 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 and I really obviously love that. So, uh, that's Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. So that is Virginia Woolf. If you want to learn more about Virginia Woolf or if you want more recommended reading, um, I would say start with her biography by Quentin Bell. Um, and you can find her, all her letters and her diaries and she, her essays are amazing. Just fantastic. She has this one where she writes how she bought a Persian cat with the first money she ever earned from writing. It's really funny. And if you ever think Virginia Woolf can't be funny, either read Orlando or read her essays because they are fantastic. So I guess that's all from me about Virginia. I guess I will talk to you guys later and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.